Hi everyone, welcome to this um, video about social media inspired teaching and learning. So this is supposed to be a live presentation but unfortunately I won't be able to make it. Kasi hindi ka muna papasok sa school. So I just have it pre-recorded and let everyone watch this video. So again the topic is about social media inspired teaching and learning processes. So for the past few sessions, I believe you were able to encounter different technologies shared by some of our colleagues and members of the faculty about different technologies, different applications, and different approaches on how we can be able to do remote learning with, with this pandemic, with this issue about pandemic. So right now, I will be just talking about or sharing about different approaches on how we can be able to utilize or some of the common tools which we are already using which is the social media so i will be focusing on tools tips and different technologies that i can be able to share with you so primarily why are we going to use social media that's that's the biggest question because actually the education sector is half-hearted sa paggamit ng social media so the the argument here is is it really helpful for our learners and for the teachers to use social media so before i share you the actual technicalities of this presentation or the actual concepts and the applications that we will be using let's have first answer why we need or somehow utilize social media well everybody has their go-to social media platform when they want to share something with the world. So where do millennials currently go? Of course, the answer is social media. So we have Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Our current learners, are, our students, are actually more on the millennials and the Generation Z type of learners. And majority of them, or almost some of them, even have all of those, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube accounts. So for this session, I'll be focusing more on the Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. Well, primarily, I did not include Facebook because that's very common and i think you were all able to explore facebook you, you we use facebook groups to create um a common channel or a common communication channel for our for our students for our classes for the sharing of files etc and we also use facebook messenger for the group chat for the easier access to communication with all the individuals involved in our classes so i didn't i no longer included that because i think that's more of a common knowledge some might not have instagram site some might have twitter account but i think majority do have facebook account so i excluded the facebook application for for this session so i'll be focusing more on instagram youtube and twitter and i'll be sharing some of the tips and tools that we can be able to use alongside with these applications so before we get started here are some few concepts that we really have to consider before we set up those social media platforms to be included in our teaching and learning process. So the first one is to determine our audience. Since we have types of learners, we have students from different courses, we have students from different year levels, and it is very imperative, it's very important as well to consider kung ano ba yung differences between this type of learners in terms of demographics and in terms of the teaching approaches. So we have to know who our audience are. Second one is know your school policies. May alam ka ba sa batas? So every time naman that we design OBTL or learning plans, all of our objectives there should be cascaded from the goals and objectives of the university itself. So from the mission and vision, core values, going down to the department or the college level up to the subject level we have to identify those policies and all of the policies everything that we're trying to implement to our classes should be aligned with the school policies so some questions such as can i post pictures of my students can i use my school's name on those social media applications do I have to provide the user account details to my administrator or how can I interact with my students? Or are there any provisions in our student handbook on our on employee's handbook about code of ethics that we are not supposed to be using social media? So if there are some provisions, then that might hinder us to utilize this tool. However, if wala naman nakalagay doon, so primarily we can be able to utilize these applications. Third one is to decide if your account will be private or public. Primarily, if it's public, then everyone can access it. But Or for instance, you posted a video on, on YouTube, then you just want to control and monitor who can be able to view those videos. Then you can set it to private. Or sometimes they call it unlisted. So it's, it's up to you on your purpose. Or do you want not just your students, but the general public can also be able to 
use your video as a learning tool. And last one is to check the guidelines for interacting with students. So we have to consider the individual guidelines on a per class basis together with the learning hours that they have. You have to consider the length of the video that you're going to create versus the learning hours that they have in a specific day or in a specific week so that um, you're sure that the applications that you're using and the tool that you were able to create are actually aligned with the with the overall policies. All right, let's start with the first one, Instagram. So we all know that Instagram is a platform where we can actually upload pictures and short clips of videos. And we also have there the feature of My Story, which will eventually allow you to upload short clip of videos and pictures also, but will disappear after 24 hours. Okay, so why, why can we use or why do we need to use Instagram? Because with the use of pictures and those short videos, we have a lot of learners who are actually visual. And a picture always reinforces the concept. So sometimes if we're going to compare a text, a, a, a list of notes and a picture, or an infographic, majority of the learners will be able to have great retention when you show them graphics. So a picture always reinforces the concept and images reveal large amounts of data. So remember, use an image instead of long text. And of course, our audience or our students will be able to appreciate it. So how are we going to make use of Instagram for teaching? And why not use it? The first one is what we call the showcase showdown. So you can make use of Instagram to ask your students to post their outputs and use a unique hashtag. So para if you want to view your students' outputs, you just click that specific hashtag, then maglo-load na lahat ng mga post with that hashtag, and you can be able to see, ah, this is their assignment, this is their assignment or their first activity, and they were able to post a short clip of video. So an example of this is, um, for instance, you ask them to write a program. So you can ask them to record a program when, or to record um, a short video of their running program and have it posted on Instagram. Then they can just make use of a specific hashtag for that specific activity. So for your end, you can be able to see also all of those um, posted images and videos with, with that specific hashtag. The second one is a glanceable graphics. These are short graphics or set of images that discusses a certain topic briefly and straight to the point. Previously, a few years ago, you can only actually post a single image on Instagram for each post. But now you can actually post multiple um, images in one post. Or you can even have it lay out, lay out it on a specific um, divisions with, with different grids or something like that. So with those um, new functions in, in Instagram, you can be able to actually create a short lecture, a short infographics that will allow your students to view at the same time learn through those images. So imagine when your students are actually browsing their Instagram account, if they followed your account or your, your teaching um, Instagram account, then they can be able to see randomly some some short lectures and they will be able to learn something from that okay and the last one that you can be able to make use with instagram are pop quizzes so you can make use of instagram my story which can be used as a short um dichotomous quiz when you speak of dichotomous quiz these are just questions that can be answered by a yes or no so you can post a my story for a specific day and just have them answer it um like true or false or yes or no then every time that they click their answers there, you can be able to see on your account who are those um, specific students who answer those questions and what are their specific answers. Okay, so I mean, you can actually use it as an assessment tool, but as entirely as assessment tool because it's very limited, but at least it creates some sort of interaction between the teacher and the learner. Okay, this one is uh, if you have short clips on Instagram but you want to have a full length video presentation or a lecture presentation that you want to upload, you created a video, then you can make use of YouTube. YouTube is very um, fun, um, very common to a lot of students and to a lot of educators. And we all know that we are actually creating um, videos and have it uploaded on YouTube. There are actually a lot of video streaming or video sharing platforms so you have daily motion 
you also have Vimeo, but the most common, I think, is YouTube. So bringing your ideas to life with the right educational video format. So if you want to come up with your YouTube channel, you can always have that one and have all of those videos uploaded on that one. But we have to consider that every time that we're going to create an educational channel in YouTube, we have to consider these three main points in creating and uploading videos. Okay, let's have the first one, align with learner's needs. So as an educator or someone providing real-world job skills and advice, well, we might want to keep our audience needs top of mind. So that's our priority. And here are the few key ideas that we want to consider when planning our channel's content. The first one is the usefulness. The purpose of educational video is, of course, to help the precisely or and precisely communicate the concepts. If your content is incorrect or irrelevant, it may not go far. So primarily, we have to make sure that the video that we're actually uploading is that something that's very useful to our learners, meaning it should be aligned with our topic. Because primarily, if you just uploaded a video and with the contents of, of those videos, which can be just read on a book, and you did not include actually some some explanations or hands on our visual learning approaches, then that might not be useful for our learners. So remember, it needs to be accurate too. You just need to be smart about it. So we're uploading video not for just not for the sake of uploading one, but for us to be able to share something useful to our learners. The second one is timing. And audiences have an appetite for great videos year-round. However, for more academically focused content, there's a specific time where demand actually picks off for, for um, when do we upload a video. So just make sure that every time that every time that you want to upload a video, it's not too late in terms of your OBTL plan or not too advanced in terms of OBTL plan. So as much as possible, upload it when it is necessary, when it is already when it's already aligned with your topic okay so that or you can have it advanced but not too late so so that you can be able to have something for those who want to study in advance for your students who want to study in advance the next one is packaging creating a series or a show with scheduled releases can help create a viewing habit for your audience so that's that's actually the benefit of not having it uploaded all at once Right? So specifically, if it's for instance a programming video, it creates excitement for our learners kapag nakikita nila that that's over the continuation of this video. And when they subscribe to your channel, they will be, they will, they will, they will be notified if a new video has been uploaded. And you can just make use of our expertise to design a learning path of content or a curriculum that meets specific needs or learning goals around a topic and put it together in a playlist. So it's very important that you know how to create a playlist in your YouTube channel. So that you can be able to group. Not all of your videos are scattered on your channel. For instance, you're actually handling five courses or five um, subjects. Make sure to create playlists for all of those subjects so that your learners across different courses and different sections will not have difficulty of browsing your channel and looking for all of the videos for their learning, for their, uh, learning habits. You can also use titles and video descriptions to number of videos that go together sequentially so that it's easy for students to follow along. And you can include videos from other channels um, too. So if you don't have the luxury of creating your own YouTube videos, you can actually just get videos from other channels and have it included on your playlist. Okay, you're not copying, you're not copying naman the actual videos eh. Okay, but you're just linking. So you're not actually getting all of the videos illegally because you're just linking it from from the other um, uploaders channel so it will still be shown from their channel but it's just included on your playlist and the last one is branding it can be beneficial to brand your your series with a consistent look all right so for instance you name your own channel and then you come up with your own logo you come up with your own brand because that somehow creates a consistent look, feel, and title description, personality, and schedule of, of your account. So, for example, thumbnails that have similar visual design can make it easier for viewers to see that a set of videos actually go together. Because as I've said, we have a lot of learners who are actually visual. The second important factor that we need to consider in creating educational videos in YouTube is 
building credibility with research and resources. So producing educational content often requires research upfront and misinformation can spread quickly and weaken your authority as an educator. Under the build credibility with research and resources, we have here different um, tips to keep in mind so that our channel is as accurate as possible. The first one is we can collaborate with teachers and experts. So since we're not just the expert in the field, we have actually our colleagues, our co-faculty members, or even someone from the industry, we can collaborate actually with them. There are actually several online platforms that can help us connect with each other as educators. So we also have show your sources. So at the end of the video presentation, it's um, a good practice to always show your sources. So citing third-party sources in the video and even in the description field can help support factual claims and add an additional layer of credibility. You can also consult multiple sources and this should, let's just try to stick to reputable publications, peer-reviewed journals, primary sources, and even students or teachers conducting researches. Because if our content are actually research-based, then that creates a good credibility for, for our channel, for our videos, and even for us as educators. Just to make sure, we can also make use of fact and grammar check. You can make use of um, built-in add-on functionalities for browsers like Grammarly or any other applications that will allow us to automatically check your grammar on your videos or while you edit your videos. Just make sure every time you... you upload a video, you were able to check the fact that all of the contents are actually factual and that the sentences that you actually put on the entire videos are actually grammatically correct. And last one is, it's not bad to actually highlight your credentials. So if you have um, advanced degrees, certifications, or other credibility enhancing distinctions, you can consider referencing them because that creates or that builds also credibility with the content of your educational video and last one is developing a unique video format so as educators who will be utilizing youtube in creating um, educational videos creating a unique video learning experience can actually help hook the attention of our target audience and even reach new viewers for instance lang you want to make your your channel monetize and here are some tips to consider when developing our um, video style the first one is of course do your homework one way to get started is to research what formats are popular and which ones resonate with you there are actually some creative examples that you can see when you try to um, visit the youtube channels guide so minsan um Actually, I tried uploading videos before for lecture videos and sometimes it's actually very boring kung very straightforward lang yung video na ginagawa natin. So sometimes you can actually put memes or you can actually put short clips of videos that will create some sort of humor or that will cut off the boredom of your viewers or even your learners. Be intentional. You design videos with the intention of creating content that viewers want to watch, which is to attract our learners. Since it's actually remote learning, we have to create a video that will actually excite our students to watch the next series or the next part of the video that you will be uploading. So if you don't believe in it, well, primarily, your audience likely won't either. So test different video lengths, check YouTube analytics to see how long viewers watch your videos for, and adjust accordingly. You can use playlists to guide viewers through multiple lessons or concepts. So it's not actually advisable to have a very lengthy video upload, especially for for educational video videos, because some of the viewers easily get bored. So you can make use of the analytics features in your YouTube channel to identify um, on an average how long ba na nanonood yung mga viewers nyo, particularly your students. And from there, so most likely the next videos that you will be creating would need to adjust. Okay, so you might need to create shorter videos or if it's short, then their maximum is actually maximum. The, the length has always been maximized, then you can opt for a longer videos. So it's a matter of um, trial and error in terms of uploading a series of videos in your YouTube channel. You also have to keep it snappy. You can try using visual aids like illustrations, animated graphics, sound effects, and upbeat music to keep it moving. Okay, so that it's not a plain, boring presentation. You can mix the medicine 
in with a candy. So what do you mean by this? Educational, educational videos don't need to be a lecture. Channel your inner vlogger or a comedian or comedian and make videos that are much fun as they are informative. So you can try to con- combine being informative and being humorous as educators. It's also advisable to script everything. Writing a script keeps our videos on track and helps you stick to the facts. It can help you rehearse and when you shoot, try improvising when discussing concepts you are um, you know are correct. Okay, so para lang naman tayo na sa klase din ito while you're actually discussing. You just create or record a video continuously just like you're discussing the lecture to a class. Then after that one, just do the editing to make it more snappy to make it more humorous to make it more interesting as much as possible you can also infuse interactivity so try building in quizzes or Q&A section where viewers can respond in the comments so at the middle of the video you can actually ask the audience then ask them to put their comments below something like that adding a few seconds of silence after a quiz question can give your audience time to answer you can also broadcast your test live and have a conversation with your audience about the answers okay and you can also bring in guests this can be a great way to add credibility and fresh perspective so if you have your own YouTube channel and you're uploading you're uploading educational videos you can always collaborate with other um, educators who are also producing educational videos okay that's actually what they call sometimes they what they call the Socrative approach it doesn't necessarily have to be with the same field and um, sometimes you can also go live because YouTube also has the features that allows you to go live with your um, video presentation. And the last one is Twitter. So Twitter is actually an application or a social media application that allows you to post short messages or short status. And they're actually known for hashtags. So here are the four things that you can actually do with Twitter. And why do we, or, or why can we use Twitter for, for e-learning or even distance learning? The first one is that Twitter is actually easy to use and highly interactive. So how it is easy to use? Because the, the functionalities are actually very basic. You can just post, edit your post, like, retweet, share, or something. And the most common or the most famous is the use of hashtags so hashtags can be used in various way all of which being effective and you can use a hashtag to communicate directly with your learners so you can actually set a hashtag for a specific teaching or learning session remotely so that your students can actually put there or tweet what they actually learn for that specific day and use the hashtags that you've actually declared to use for that specific session okay it is also ideal for what we call the micro learning okay why, why did we call it micro learning because um twitter post allows only 140 characters so it limit it forces you to apply the essence of micro learning or what we call the concise and impactful so meaning you have to find a way to be able to deliver a specific um powerful definition of terms for instance or a learning concept for instance in a very short narrative 140 character narrative so in that case you there's more retention because you are able to come up with a concise definition or a concise concept with a limited character sometimes students tend to forget um, definitions of terminologies with uh, using longer length of words and phrases or even paragraphs twitter also provides opportunities for real-time discussion so using twitter for live microblogging is probably the biggest advantage of twitter posting during an e-learning event or lecture for um, fosters online discussion so for instance you go live on your youtube channel you're trying to discuss a specific topic you're trying to create a demo or demo uh, a programming demo since you want to focus on what you're teaching and you don't want to entertain current questions yet, you can ask them to just tweet their questions and after your presentation, after after your demonstration, you can just go back to those tweets using the hashtags and be able to read their questions, comments about the lecture. And lastly, Twitter can be used for, to acquire e-learning feedback. So sometimes, educators, as educators, who also want to um, receive feedback based on how we actually deliver the lesson. So because Twitter is so easy to use, it encourages instant and direct communication, encouraging your audience to connect 
or to comment on their e-learning experience can provide you with opportunity to collect valuable feedback about the effectiveness of your e-learning course. So if you want to hear from your students or from our students how effective we think or they think the e-learning course was delivered, they can make use of Twitter as well. So here are the sources or references that I actually used. The most important here, I think, is the YouTube Creator Academy. You can search for that. And that's actually a lot of content. There's actually a lot of content that can help you, especially if you want to create your new educational videos channel that will help you come up with more interesting, more reliable, and more snappy kind of videos for, for your teaching and learning processes. Okay, so I'm not saying that I'm actually expert in this field. In fact, I'm not good at recording videos. I'm not good at editing videos and discussing online. But I think I just gathered all of those, I think, valuable cons con contents which I can actually share with you. Okay? So that's the end of this video, video for the social media applications that we can use for the teaching and e-learning process. So if you have questions, you can send me an email at lrh.ismanila.org. Thank you.